This is Kate Swoboda, creator of YourCourageousLife.com, director of the Courageous Living Coach Certification at TeamCLCC.com, and author of the book, The Courage Habit, which is available at booksellers and at Amazon. The Your Courageous Life podcast is all about going after what you want and creating and living a more courageous, emotionally resilient life. Might drop a couple of F-bombs, so maybe don't listen with your kids in the backseat of the car. And here we go with today's episode. All right, today I've got something of a different topic than I usually tackle and something of one that I, I find sort of fascinating and interesting and also sometimes troubling, and it's the topic of narcissism and gaslighting. So if you've been on the internet at all since the Trump administration, then you probably know that there is a regular and ongoing discussion of narcissism and gaslighting because there in popular culture was ongoing speculation that Trump might be a clinical narcissist and that he would routinely gaslight people. And perhaps after you saw some descriptions, particularly on social media, because there are graphics all over the place, these are the signs of gaslighting, these are the signs of a narcissist, things like that, you might have wondered if certain people in your own life are narcissists. You might have wondered, is this person that I'm in conflict with trying to gaslight me? So let's talk about what those terms actually mean. And particularly, I'm going to be talking about when use of these terms can be an overstatement of harm that ends up escalating conflict in our relationships rather than what I presume we all want, which is to de-escalate conflict. So first, let's talk about clinical narcissism. It is a personality disorder involving self-aggrandizement, which is about I'm the best, I always need to be the best, I always associate with the best people, a need to be special. There will be no admission of fault Um, in true clinical narcissism, um, like I'm talking no admission of fault. Like you would not see someone say, I'm sorry. There would be no recognition of the needs of others. And I'm pulling some of these from um, the Mayo Clinic. So if you go to mayoclinic.org and you do a search for narcissistic personality disorder, you can see a full description. And gaslighting, according to the Google is to, quote, manipulate someone by psychological means into questioning their own sanity. To manipulate someone by psychological means into questioning their own sanity. And it comes from this movie that was put out in the 40s called Gaslight, in which a husband intentionally tried to drive his wife crazy by lowering the lights in the room which at the time were controlled by gas rather than electricity. And when she would talk to him about how dim the lights were, he'd say, I don't know what you're talking about. And he did this on purpose to psychologically manipulate his wife into questioning reality. He was trying to drive her crazy. And the reason that it entered the cultural conversation that Trump could be a clinical narcissist is in the constant talking that he would do about how he's the best and the smartest and the refusal to admit to any fault or take responsibility for his behaviors. He's also been called a gaslighter. There are videos where he says X and later denies he ever said X, and that could be an example of gaslighting. There are videos where he um, talks about how you know he never did a thing, and then there's like an actual video where he in fact did do the thing. And we don't need to resuscitate every example. There are many, they're easy to find if you wish to find them. And we can't actually diagnose ethically, psychologists can't diagnose someone with clinical narcissism just from observing these behaviors. There can be speculation, but that's about it. But I actually don't want to talk about Trump. He's had enough airtime. I want to talk about how narcissism and gaslighting have entered the everyday pop culture lexicon. And now there is an actual bias, I think to start seeing these traits in everyday human conflict. And I have a concern that the application of terms like these, when they're inaccurate, can really escalate human conflict. So in other words, sometimes I'm seeing people call things narcissism and gaslighting purely because they are offended, not necessarily because they are accurate terms to apply to the situation. And so here's what I mean by that. I'm going to give an example. Let's say that, oops, you step on someone's foot 
and it hurts. So they're angry at you. And in conversations where someone misunderstands what narcissism and gaslighting actually are and deploy those terms carelessly, use of those terms could escalate the conflict rather than work towards a solution. So let's say this person turns to you and says, you stomped on my foot. That was mean and that was unkind and I'm standing up for myself and I'm not taking your shit anymore. And then you feeling maybe confused or in in particular defensive because you've been accused of something and because you're feeling defensive in that moment, you're more focused on defending yourself than on apologizing. You might go, whoa, wait, I I didn't stomp on your foot. I mean, I stepped on it by accident. Sorry about that, but I, I didn't mean to. And then if the person comes back and says, no, you stomped on my foot. How can you deny that? I was right there. I saw it. You stomped on my foot. And then you're going, no, no, I stepped on it by accident. I didn't stomp on it on purpose. How can you think I do that on purpose? And then the person's going, well, look at this. See, it's always about you. It's always about you, you, you. Well, what about me? And the fact that you stomped on my foot, how can you take the focus off the fact that my foot is hurting? And then you're sitting here going, I'm not trying to take the focus off of your foot hurting. I'm trying to talk about the fact that I didn't intentionally step on your foot, which is what you're accusing me of when you say stomp. You're coming at me. Well, now, if you're not agreeing with what this person says, if this person is inaccurately deploying a term like gaslighting, they might start going, well, see, you're gaslighting my experience now. Is here. I saw what you did. It was definitely a stomp. You're trying to convince me it never happened. And then you're going, I'm not trying to convince you that it never happened. I'm trying to convince you that we have different ideas about what happened. It wasn't intentional. And then maybe that person's going, well, impact is more important than intention. And the impact you had on me was that I felt like my foot was stomped on. And then you're going, but so you're saying I'm supposed to say I did stomp on your foot just so I'm validating your experience. And then the person's going, yeah, you see, look at this. You never take responsibility for your actions. Now let's break down that kind of a scenario for a moment. Stomping on feet, stepping on feet, two different interpretations of what actually happened. You know, most humans, when they are in conflict with someone, feel defensive. Am I saying that it would be great if people got better at the skill of diffusing their defensiveness sooner? Yeah, of course. But I'm talking about most humans when they're in conflict with someone and that person is the first thing out of the gate saying, you did this thing and they are going, no, I didn't. They feel defensive and most of their focus goes to defending. So if someone is defensive and does not want to take responsibility for their behavior according to the perspective of the other person coming to them, this does not automatically mean that the person who's defensive is a narcissist. It just means they're defensive. You know, in the example I just gave, the defensive party isn't saying, I never even went near your foot. What are you talking about? They're arguing with the interpretation of intent, not saying it never happened that way. And in conflicts, it is very common for two different people to experience things very differently and thus prompting two different realities. And I get concerned when I see people talking about, I'm ready to like leave my marriage because I'm convinced my partner is a narcissist and the examples they're giving are not necessarily narcissism. It's two different people who have two different perspectives about what's going on. And that's what this podcast is about. So if you are dealing with an actual clinical narcissist and you're like, no, really, this is a narcissist. I'm not saying your, your experience is invalid. I'm not saying you should question it. I'm not, I'm not doing any of that. That's, that's a different podcast. Okay. Uh, Different podcast. If you're actually dealing with a confirmed narcissist, I'm saying we need to keep in mind that just as someone else's interpretation of what happened or what the behaviors were can differ their interpretations of us can also be very different. And I think one thing that could be helpful would be if as a society, we got clearer about what clinical diagnoses actually entail. And and I want to say really transparently, I am not qualified to diagnose anyone with anything. But I was in a marriage and family therapy program where I took graduate level coursework in diagnostics. And that was tied to a master's in counseling degree. And the professor for that class emphasized 
that if you look too much at the DSM or the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, you'll start to see yourself in everything. The question of diagnosis is often tied to severity and prevalence. So again, let me say that. The diagnosis is often tied to severity and prevalence. So how intense are the symptoms and how often are they happening? So yes, let's just go with an example. From a diagnostic perspective, clinical narcissists overly focus on trying to be the best or on outward appearances. But we have to take into consideration the entire picture. So let's say there's someone who wears a lot of makeup. And maybe they're even really judgmental of people who don't put a lot of time into their appearance or who don't wear makeup. Maybe they're the kind of person who are like, oh my God, she's really letting herself go. Now, if you said to me, well, people who are you know that way about makeup, that sounds like a really unattractive quality in a person, very superficial. Well, yeah, I'd, I'd be inclined to agree with you. But if the same person who's really into the makeup also makes a point of um, always taking care of their grandmother and they live with other people and they clean up the house for their family members. And if somebody comes to them and says, you know what, you made a mistake, they're very apologetic and they really want to make amends, guess what? They are not a narcissist just because they have this extreme focus on outward appearances or because they judge others who don't put as much time into appearance. I suppose you could say that's an example of a narcissistic leaning behavior, but that's not enough to actually call someone a full on narcissist. And you might hear that example go, yeah, Kate, got it. I I wouldn't call someone a narcissist based on that, but let me tell you about my in-laws or let me tell you about my family member. Let me tell you about my coworker. It's like, okay, I'm going to give you another example. Let's say that there's a marriage that's been marked by arguments and conflict for a few years because one person feels that life should be less about the hustle. They want to slow down. They want to have less going on in the household. That's that's what's calling to them. They don't want to have so many plans. But the other partner is a workaholic, high achiever who gets a ton of validation out of working. And that person also has trouble apologizing when they are wrong. So they say and do things, for instance, that are snippy and irritable, and they never want to admit to that. And in fact, when it's pointed out, they tend to deny, deflect, oh, well, you know, it wasn't that irritable, come on, or they'll redirect, like, well, well, wait, hold on, you sound pretty irritable right now, am I supposed to get get all over your case for that? If you just cherry pick the examples of their workaholic behaviors and their difficulty with apologies or tendencies to deflect none of which are are behaviors that I'm saying are the healthiest behaviors for anybody, right? But if you just cherry pick those examples, it would be pretty easy to paint a picture of this person as this clinical narcissist who's just gaslighting their partner in the marriage and denying that their needs matter and, and, you know, uh, oh, like unable to say when they're wrong. And, you know, it'd be very easy to do that. But you would have to look at the entire picture of the person. That's what a psychologist or a licensed professional would do to accurately assess for narcissism. So for instance, if this same person who is a workaholic and has trouble admitting when they've been irritable, if they are a cardiologist who is dealing with a lot of secondary vicarious trauma due to the pressures of their job, and while in their marriage they are distant or conflict-ridden, But with their patients, the patients would be like, oh my God, Dr. So-and-so is so kind and so supportive. Well, is this person a high achiever who always sends heartfelt cards to friends on birthdays? Is this person someone who has at another time in the marriage when it was less conflict-ridden, held their partner, been romantic, um, really offered empathy or tenderness? Now, again, I'm not qualified to diagnose, and I'm not trying to give you diagnostic tips in this podcast. I'm just sharing what I learned as a result of my education when I was in an MFT program, when I completed my master's in psychology, which is that when someone is diagnosed with a mental health issue, the entire person and the broader context of their life is supposed to be looked at, not just their worst character flaw, like being superficially focused on outward appearances with makeup, not just who they are in one relationship like a marriage 
Whereas in other relationships or in other parts of their lives, they have a capacity for empathy and warmth. So again, here's why I'm talking about this. I see a lot of relationships being essentially destroyed because people start throwing out these terms, which escalates conflict. And when we start throwing out these accusations of narcissism or gaslighting, not because the totality of someone's life adds up to that, but rather because we feel someone is being selfish or self-centered, that person is actually less likely to work things out with you. And if we accuse anyone who doesn't agree with our assessment of a situation as, well, you're gaslighting, well, then conflict is escalated because gaslighting is not the same as two different people having two different interpretations of what happened. The point is, when conflict is unnecessarily escalated, no one gets what they want. The person throwing out the accusation, they don't get what they want. In fact, the behavior of the person they're accusing of narcissism or gaslighting is actually even less likely to change, which unfortunately will only appear as more evidence that the person must be a clinical narcissist who gaslights and won't admit when they're wrong. And it's, it's not the same thing to not admit when you are wrong when in fact there is evidence that you could like literally hand someone like, hey, you did this thing, it's on video, is different than this stomped, stepped on example, which is two different perspectives. And the person receiving the accusation is probably feeling defensive or hurt or embarrassed. And what's more, when these terms are inaccurately deployed, they're also not going to fully trust that feedback because on some level, they know it's crazy to throw out terms just because there's conflict. I mean, go back to this stomped versus stepped on the foot example. If you know that it truly was an accident that you stepped on someone's foot, but they are committed to believing that you intentionally stomped on their foot. Aren't you a bit mistrustful of their ability to accurately perceive the world? And again, just so that I'm clear, so no one thinks I'm trying to (laughs) gaslight around the existence of narcissism, (laughs) I do think that clinical narcissists and gaslighters really do exist. If you are dealing with someone who really fits into those categories, that's very real. And it's wrong for them to mistreat you. In no way do I blame the victim of someone's narcissism. I just think these labels are being applied very liberally. And narcissists are in fact more rare than people might realize based on how often these discussions are appearing on social media. And I think there's something worrisome about taking graphics that are appearing on social media of supposed diagnostic traits, which is how they are often laid out to sort of empower the social media viewer to start diagnosing people in their lives. I, I find something unethical about that, especially when it comes from coaches or people in personal growth who don't have concurrent training. And I think that it's worth noticing that While it may temporarily feel powerful to have a label to put on something, especially when you feel that someone has hurt you, it doesn't actually solve the problem. And of course, I think someone can wholeheartedly disagree with what I'm sharing here, and that's okay too. In my mind, the problem is the conflict that doesn't get resolved by deployment of inaccurate terms. And two different people's views of what happened without being willing to ask one another why they feel the way they feel and to truly listen to the answers from others when they're given. So let's talk about some alternative approaches then. A better approach for when you are angry, when you are convinced that someone did something on purpose or is trying to cause harm. Well, first... Instead of it being you're a narcissist or you're a gaslighter, you did this on purpose with accusations, talk about it from a frame of how you feel. I feel as if you might have stomped on my foot on purpose, and I feel that way because I saw you lift up your foot and bring it down really hard while you were making eye contact with me. There you go. Instead of it, you did this, I feel this way and here's why. 
And if the person is going, no, that's not what happened, then it's like, okay, are you willing to consider that this is new information? You could also ask questions. Did you stomp on my foot just now? Or was that an accident? You know, diffuse conflict by speaking to your experience and understand that when you bring these things up with people, you're not asking these questions or sharing your experience so that they will automatically confirm what you just said. This is part of the skill of navigating conflict. That is not how it works. It is just not how it works. You know, you don't, you, you aren't going to always bring something to someone and then they're going to go, you know what? You're right. Okay. People get defensive. So be aware that they may be getting defensive without even being aware that they're getting defensive. I have someone in my life who struggles with that, actually. One of the first things that they do, and I think we all struggle with this on some level, but there's one person in my life in particular where when we are in conflict, the first thing that they do is they get defensive, super defensive. They do not want to hear anything I'm saying. And one of the things that I've needed to do is when there's conflict with this person, the, I am, am working on remembering that the first few things that come out of their mouth are likely to be defensive things, and I need to just breathe with that for a moment and let them be defensive because it's the default they go to. They don't seem to have a lot of control over it. I know it's not their intention, but it's just where they go, and it's like, okay, I have to mentally tell myself in my head as I'm hearing their words, Kate, okay, don't react to this. They're just getting defensive. Let's breathe. Let's try to work through this. And you can see how it would escalate conflict and had before I started to do this when I would bring something to them, they would get defensive and then I'd be like, oh God, you know, you, you know now I'm angry because you won't just admit, da, 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 you know, and then it blows up from there. So, and, and there are ways you can respond when people are defensive. You can say, I, I'm not trying to accuse you of anything. It was my perception that you stomped on my foot because I saw you lift up your foot and bring it down really hard and I saw you making eye contact. I could be wrong. Another thing you can do when you really feel angry that someone has done something to you, give it time. You know, have you have you ever finished a conversation where you were defensive? When someone brought something to you where you were unwilling to admit any responsibility, and then after you calmed down, you realized, "Eh, okay, (laughs) so maybe that person had a valid point. Well, great. Then you know that time can be something of a curative for conflict. So if you are bringing something to someone and they get defensive rather than going to, they must be a narcissist, they must be trying to gaslight me, maybe give them some time to digest what you've brought to them. See if they might come back later and they're willing to say, you know, when I think about uh, how fast I was running around in the backyard, I can see how it appeared like I was going to stomp on your foot. I got to tell you, I did not intend for it that way, but I can see how it felt that way. And I'm sorry. Another thing you could do is to get better at your own defensiveness and your own apologies. You know, this is one of the best ways in my mind to see the vulnerability and self-reflection and awareness that is involved in making an apology. Make more of them yourself. Notice your own defensive tendencies and you'll recognize all the places where you get defensive and don't want to apologize. And it humanizes the fact that other people might do the same thing when egos get in the way. And as you start to examine your own apologies, this is an opportunity too for you to notice if you are always the one apologizing, just putting some attention on your own process for apologies can help you to see, am I in an unhelpful relational dynamic with this person? Unhelpful as in either I struggle to apologize, I get defensive, and then I want to nail them when they're defensive and they struggle to apologize, or... I don't struggle to apologize. In fact, I'm so quick to apologize that it's like I'm people pleasing and taking more responsibility for the situation than I really should. And it doesn't feel good. Last thing, I am never saying that abusive behavior should just be excused. Okay. We need to confront abusive behavior and speak truth to abusive behavior. 
So critical thinking time. Of course, I'm not saying that when people are abusive or when there's an actual narcissist in the room that we just throw glitter in the air and look for ways to rationalize their behavior. No, I'm not saying that. I'm only saying that sometimes it is worth looking at how we create more drama or conflict or discord or sadness or anger in our lives when we are inaccurate about how we apply certain labels. A licensed psychologist would take in a multitude of factors when making a diagnosis. So I'm saying let's not get so into the pop culture references or armchair psychology that we start making these diagnoses of our partners or our family members or other people that we are not qualified to make. And let's instead start looking at, are, am I focusing on the things that will help to diffuse conflict and trying to enroll them as well in being part of the solution? How am I showing up in this conflict? Is there a way that's better to show up that might diffuse the conflict more while I'm also paying attention to not getting into a codependent dynamic or taking responsibility for them and their reactions and their anger. You're not responsible for somebody else's anger. You're not responsible for somebody else's behavior. We don't get what we want and no one is really winning when the only thing we're doing is finger pointing. And I want us to just think about how to diffuse conflict, not amplify it, And I want us all to be more responsible around how we consume these terms and these graphics that are all over social media, essentially trying to equip the general population to diagnose things that really require a little bit more complication and nuance to diagnose accurately. So let's both have the courage to call things what they are and to apply integrity in being accurate and responsible when we call things as they are. And please, if you really do think you're caught in an abusive dynamic with a narcissist, or if you even suspect that you are, bring in the help of a licensed professional who can help you to really see what's going on because you need and you deserve that support. All right, that's today's podcast. Thank you so much for listening to today's episode. You know you can continue the work and the fun if you want to. Head on over to yourcourageouslife.com forward slash begin and become a Your Courageous Life subscriber because as soon as you sign up, you get access to an entire library of worksheets and audios and other bonuses. And of course, you'll be receiving more courage in your inbox and who wouldn't love that? You can learn more about the Courageous Living Coach Certification at teamclcc.com. You can get The Courage Habit at your local bookseller, on Amazon, wherever you like. We can even connect on social media. I'm on Facebook at Your Courageous Life. So look for facebook.com forward slash Your Courageous Life. And I'm on Instagram as Kate Courageous. And I'd love to connect with you on Instagram. So here's to you using these courageous tools in your life and creating a real ripple effect of good. And again, thanks so much for listening. I love it that you're here.